Bom, é, em primeiro lugar, I think I'll make this in English because I want to make a dialogue with Jeff because Jeff is going to make his final remarks. So I'll excuse our colleagues from uh, those who need uh, translation, please. I took notes, so the discussion was very rich. So I feel that we come to the end of the meeting uh, with mission accomplished. You know, I, the idea was to have a consultation with the science academies, and we had a very rich discussion. And I think we reached our objectives. Um, Here is a quick summary that I made. I took notes. I have this bad habit of making synthesis of everything that I participate in. But bear with me, these are preliminary findings. And it's mostly in Portuguese. Yeah, it's mostly in Portuguese. Um, th this is a response to Anna's comments. I think there are some specific issues about the Amazon. And the Amazon is very isolated, historically, as uh, Roberto uh, pointed out. Uh, there is very little communication within Amazonia. People from, to go from Acre to Amapá, it's easier to go than going from Rio or Sao Paulo to Paris. You know? It takes longer and it's more expensive. So because of this, people do not have lots of interaction. And much less interaction among countries. So people who are in Amazonas don't go to Pando, or don't go to Madre Dios, or these other states of the Amazon. There's very little communication, very little. No flights, no roads, so basically it's hard to get there. Uh, so I think, Anna, you raised a very important point. To create a network in this area is very unique. So it's very rare, and I think the Brazilian Academy of Sciences has played an important role in trying to make these bridges uh, within the academic sector. You know? which is different from the business sector. It's different from indigenous groups. Uh, so in terms of networks, we are, what we're doing is we're using a tool, a very sophisticated tool, to map these networks. And we have an expert, Luis, who is uh, working with Valley Foundation on, on mapping. This. He, he is amazing. He uses all internet connection uh, uh, data and draws maps, which are very interesting. So we're mapping those. Uh, to use. The, the, I think the most important consensus of the discussions was uh, a response to Herman's uh, provocation to have a, a plan for sustainable development in the Amazon. Um, and everybody in the table basically said, yes, that's a good enterprise. Let's link that to Yanis, you know, which uh, sounds like an interesting institutional framework for that. Um, and, and we briefly commented that we need to build a vision. What is sustainable development for the Amazon? How does, how, what is that? Everybody can agree on Brundtland's definition or Rio plus 20 definition, which is very vague. But how does that land on the reality of the Amazon? So we have to discuss that. And that's not a simple academic discussion. It is a multi-stakeholder discussion. Because the Indians certainly have a different perspective than the researchers and the business sectors and, and so on. No? Um, so it's very important to have the participation of other segments of the society. It's also important to take note that we do have an institution called OTCA, no? the Organization of the uh, Cooperation uh, uh, of the Amazon Treaty. And we, we have a very strong connection, uh, SDSN, with uh, OTCA. Uh, so the Secretary General uh, was here at the launch of SDSN in March. He came back in August because we had another meeting on poverty, so he was back. So as Itamarachi, uh, the Ambassador Clemente Baena Suarez, who is in charge of this region. So we have that, that other uh, uh, layer of interactions, so to speak. So I think that's, that's an important point that uh, uh, was discussed here. Um, another is, is a more specific one on solutions. We need to identify uh, which are the priority themes. Uh, and this is probably something that we could get, uh, uh, and this is my thought to you, the leaders of the National Academies uh, of the countries. Maybe the academies could lead uh, meetings and consultations within the countries to find which agendas, which themes are the most relevant. And maybe uh, this could be step one, and step two, a meeting, uh, another meeting like this, but with 
the Academy is bringing the results of these consultations. Which are the priorities of these uh, different countries from the science perspective? And maybe this is something that could be published as a report or as something which serves as a guideline or, or uh, published not necessarily on paper, maybe just published it in, in, uh, electronically in the internet. The second thing is that uh, science is uh, dependent on funding. So we need to see how these priorities can speak to financing mechanisms, S how the academies could leverage, could lobby in a positive way, uh, governments to come up with financing, both at the national level at, and also at the uh, international level. There was a point raised by our colleague from Colombia about the model of LBA, you know, the, the LBA as, as a good case of uh, international cooperation within the Amazon countries, uh, linking uh, several countries and United States as well. Within this context, we have the, the prize uh, the SDSN prize, which is being launched uh, uh, on Monday, uh, which can be a, a mechanism. Right now, we don't have lots of funds, but uh, ideally, Jeff, I'd like to have a, you know, one million you know, as a prize to give to whoever you know, comes up with the best solutions, the best inventions, so as to mobilize uh, 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 interest and, and creativity. So a, a third point is the need to disseminate, disseminate the findings, uh, and what we have now in the platform are not only ideas, some of these are proven projects, projects that have a, uh, results. So the SDSN platform that I talked about is something which uh, will do this purpose. The other thing which has been discussed and not yet implemented, uh, and I think speaks directly to the academic uh, uh, world, is a, 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 a magazine, a journal, uh, something that can be uh, a reference uh, for Amazonian institutions, which uh, could also speak to the point that uh, you raised, the language issue, uh, because a lot of people who would use this information do not speak English, uh, so would have to be something which is multilingual, uh, Spanish and, and, and Portuguese and English as well. Um, a fourth point was a dialogue with the public uh, policies. This was also something that was raised. The importance of uh, making sure that the findings of scientific research do make into policy making. And making this bridge is not something easy. Uh, and and uh, so creating processes of dialogue between researchers and, and policy makers. Another point that was raised now, I don't recall by whom exactly, but it was, uh, was an issue on, on human capital. And I think that is crucial. It's very, very important. And here, uh, taking again Her Herman's uh, 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 language of creating hope and, and, and a, a light in the tunnel, I'll bring you some pictures of what we're doing as foundation. So it's doable. So the, we have built eight small universities in the very middle of the rainforest, not in the cities, but out in the middle of the forest. And these are long distance education when, with providing these people a chance to become entrepreneurs of the biodiversity. And this, we've just graduated last week, the first group of 45 people who are living in the middle of the forest and had training there, not in urban areas. So it's doable. Um, so that's just to give a sense of con concreteness be, to break this uh, cold PowerPoint uh, word language. Um, so uh, finally, it's a call for contribution. The SDSN does not belong to anybody. No, it belongs to us. So few uh, owners uh, of the SDSN. It, I think it's an open platform, right, Jeff, more than anything else. So we're just the stewardess of something which is uh, an opportunity. So it's a process to invite you. So the conclusions of this workshop are going to be put available, right, in, the, in our web page. So we're going to have that, and we'll have a, a process of consultation. Um, so we have an open invitation for all the academies to be a part, an integral part of uh, the SDSN platform, and also a call to, to disseminate within your networks 
what SDSN is. You know, the link to our homepage, and our homepage is improving. And, and please do send materials that uh, you find appropriate. And finally, the next steps. Uh, the next steps that we have ahead is tomorrow. Uh, the, uh, the program continues tomorrow. Uh, and now I'd like to have the other uh, slide on, just to remind you all that uh, we have uh, a, a program that continues tomorrow. And then actually tomorrow is the best part, because we're going to take a boat. We're going to go to the uh, Rio Negro River, see one of those small universities, have a discussion there, have good food, and swim as we come back. So it's going to be much nicer. So it's a, a way of inviting you all to, to be with us tomorrow. And tomorrow we uh, begin early in the morning so that we get sunrise in the middle of the forest and then uh, come back uh, uh, later. When the program, I think all of you have the program, is coming and it's there. Right? So that's what we're going to do. We're here in Manaus and we're going upstream the Negro River. Uh, we're going to go to the National Park, through the National Park of Anavillanas, and in this area which is a part of the Sustainable Development Reserve of the Negro River. Uh, and it's one of the 19 communities uh, uh, of this reserve, and it's an area where there are lots of activities, so you get a chance to feel a little bit of the Amazon and the realities of uh, a village in the Amazon, and also one of those small universities that we have put in there. So that's just to remind you all. And, and also, Thais asked me to remind you to bring swimming uh, gear. So, so, Volta. And that's for tomorrow. So this dialogue is going to continue. Anna Tony, who is with us, is going to present uh, the strategic plan as it stands now. And Carlos Teixeira from the Parsons School of Design is going to present his vision and, and run a workshop. Actually, it's more a workshop. It's a design workshop. Uh, we're using the state-of-the-art uh, methodology of the Parsons School of Design, who is helping us design uh, this initiative. So that's for tomorrow. Um, and then we'll produce uh, quickly on our way to Lima, version 2.0. So that's going to be Anna's work on Sunday, because on Monday we're going to be presenting uh, to the Minister of Peru, the Governor of Acre, and other authorities, um, the version 2.0. So that's going to be on Monday. And after that we're going to have a consultation with indigenous people, just like we did today. We're going to have a consultation with Indian leaders of the Amazon, uh, under the umbrella of COICA, which is the Confederation of the Organization of Indigenous Peoples, the La Cuenca Amazonica, the, whatever, the Amazon Basin. Then there's a consultation also with uh, the uh, NGOs uh, under the umbrella of ARA, Articulación uh, Regional de la Amazonía. Um, después con el sector empresarial under the World Business Council for Sustainability. Uh, so we're uh, linking through the uh, Brazilian branch, like we did with uh, the Academy of uh, Sciences of Brazil, uh, with the business sector, and the, the governors, uh, governments with the OTCA, as I mentioned before. So finally, we hope to have this uh, version done, the business plan done, before September, so that we can have a side event in September. And uh, uh, Jeff is, is planning to organize something in September, so uh, as part of this something, we're going to have an Amazon something, in New York, which we don't know exactly what it is, but you're all invited to this something in New York, which is going to be something very interesting. Oh, and by the way, it's 15. It's 15. It's 15. It's 15. It's 15. <laughs> it's 15. So you're all invited to this something, and it's going to be something very interesting. Thank you. have the meeting in the context of COP20 to be able to discuss all that we have discussed. This has been an incredibly rich day with the inter-academy panel meeting in the morning and the meeting on the Amazon with the, uh, uh, with the academies of science this afternoon. There are many visions of the Amazon development. This is, I think, the key starting point. This is not news, but 
when one speaks of development of the Amazon, one can think about the indigenous populations and their perspective, the more recent colonists, but that goes back 200 years, but uh, waves of migration, the mining community, agribusiness, extractive industries, oil and gas, hydrocarbons, so the big outside industry, and the ecologists who say development in the Amazon is don't develop the Amazon, leave it alone. And there is no resolution of this issue, certainly. Uh, maybe there will never be quite a resolution because it will always be a battle of interest to some extent. But the idea of sustainable development is to try to find some wisdom by looking at the various perspectives simultaneously. Because I think if each perspective is looked at alone within a narrow community, it sounds quite compelling. And the business community has no doubt, are we really going to leave resources under the ground or above the ground in the Amazon? This is a rich place. We can get rich. And another perspective it obviously is, uh, is quite different from that. The notion of sustainable development, which I really like, is that it forces you to look at the economic, social, and environmental considerations simultaneously and in an integrated manner. No one of those is allowed to just run ahead without regard to the others. The trade-offs need to be understood if they are trade-offs. The synergies need to be built upon when they are mutually beneficial. I think it's quite astounding, maybe not astounding, actually, let me take it back. It's, maybe it's quite understandable, but very important that these are very much unresolved issues so that when we talk about these issues, even though these are ancient debates, they are current debates also because they remain unresolved. And it's not just a matter of interest, it's a matter of analysis also. If it were a pure interest group issue, I don't think scientists would play much of a role, actually. We're not a very compelling interest group. Uh, we have modest resources, and, uh, but the reason why science can add to this is better understanding of what the real issues are. And those issues keep being clarified each generation by better science. I think it's true that we understand much more what is at stake in the environment in the Amazon than was true 25 years ago. The role of biodiversity, the extreme uh, fragility of the global ecosystems to climate change, including the vulnerability of the Amazon, the two-way connections of global change to Amazonian change and Amazon dynamics causing global connections. This was not really understood very well, and there still is a lot of uncertainty about many of these elements which require further scientific work constantly. Also, as technology changes, the ability to develop in certain ways also change. So the fact that there's information technology makes it possible to do positive things in education or outreach or health that was not possible before. That's very important. On the other hand, technology makes it possible to rip down a lot more trees than ever before, makes it possible to drill more deeply than ever before, it makes it possible to have large scale change rapidly, more rapidly than ever before. I'm not a huge fan in many ways of the oil and gas industry in general because I think it's very destructive uh, what is happening. But on the other hand, I'm a huge admirer of the industry in being able to get things done. Wherever you find oil and gas, they will drill. It can be in the middle of a rainforest. It can be a thousand miles in the coast. It can be in pre-salt formations. It doesn't matter. Money will get high technology organized to do things. 
That's good in certain ways, but it's also very dangerous in other ways. There is no protection of the Amazon from its traditional distances, its long space, its uh, concentrated uh, rainforest. Those were barriers to development before. They're not really barriers now. You can build roads anywhere. You can build pipelines anywhere. You can tap any resource now. And so it raises questions. What are the real limits to what can be done? And partly those are scientific questions. For example, if you think about Yasuni uh, National Park in Ecuador, the government made a very important proposal to the world. It said, we will keep the oil under the ground if you pay us some ecosystem services. That was, in my view, a very serious proposal. It was generally mocked by the international community. Pay you to keep oil under the ground? Are you foolish? I think the mockery was stupid because it was ill-informed. People hadn't thought about it. It didn't fit into any kind of existing framework. The government's position was sound, in my opinion, but it received no international support, basically. Then the government has more recently said, OK, we'll develop the oil because it's billions of dollars for the people of Ecuador, but we'll develop it safely. This has led to a different kind of protest from the other side now. No, now you'll wreck Yasuni. You mustn't develop it. There is a basic question that I have no answer to at all from my position. Would it be possible to tap that oil without environmental destruction? That's a scientific question, an analytical question, not simply an opinion and simply a vested interest question. I think it would be one to have good independent analysis because it would make a big difference. It's hard to have independent analysis with such powerful interests around, but it's extremely important to have that kind of analysis. This applies for many proposals of development in the Amazon right now. There are many, many proposals for making profits in the Amazon, whether it's new dams, new power sources, regulated uh, uh, timber or other kinds of extraction, mining projects, road building. And the claim is always this can be done safely. And the environmental response generally is this cannot be done safely at all. The evidence base is, in, I think, crucial. Maybe it's already deeply available, or maybe it's just at the level of opinion. There is certainly no trust right now on almost any side. And by the way, I don't trust most of the companies because they are not trustworthy in general. There's no record of trust that says, you have developed resources well in the past, and we can trust you that you will develop resources well. But even if they're untrustworthy, it doesn't mean necessarily that they're wrong also. It means that they can't be trusted, that any claim needs to be verified carefully. So to my mind, this idea of an Amazon plan is vital. What is even meant by development in the Amazon? I think the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, offer a fresh opportunity to you to frame that question in a constructive way. Because the Sustainable Development Goals say, make a plan to achieve sustainable development. That means make a plan that recognizes the human needs of the people living in the region that recognizes their social needs, including cultural continuity and cultural values, which is of unique significance in this region, and recognize the ecosystem and climate services that are at stake, and do that simultaneously with all of those lenses viewing the challenge. And this time, 
always this has been fraught with great political difficulty. This has been the most contested ground of development in this region perhaps for a century. The fact that the sustainable development goals will be global goals is good. The fact that they started in Rio, I think, is undeniable. These are born in Brazil, these goals. So the Brazilian government should take pride in them and it should support the use of these goals as a way to move forward. Now, the goals don't exist exactly yet, but now we know almost exactly what they're going to be because the General Assembly Working Group on Sustainable Development Goals listed 17 objectives. And the Secretary General yesterday issued a document which said, keep those objectives, but rephrase them in an easier manner. So it's not a list of 17 goals. Make it a little bit shorter, more concise, more understandable. But basically, these 17 goals are what you need to focus on. That means that they are goals about the human condition of people in the Amazon. They are about finding creative jobs and so forth, like Virgilio just showed of having uh, people living in the forest become the new ecological generation of monitors, guides, uh, experts uh, in their region as one example, or teachers, doctors, health outreach workers, and so forth, and examine the social aspects of development and examine the effects on biodiversity, ecosystem functions, climate change, greenhouse gas emissions, and other factors. So you're invited to set quantitative objectives for the Amazon for the next 20 years and within a long-term, even longer-term vision of what development would mean. Within that, it seems to me, this process that you have underway is extremely important. First, multi-country, which has uh, always been hard in this region given Brazil's dominance, but is absolutely vital and I think very much possible right now. So this is a multi-country process that is very constructive and I'm very happy that both Ianis and SDSN can help to provide good space for that multi-country process. Second, I think you have the opportunity to think through and state, perhaps more coherently than it's ever been stated before, what the vision of sustainable development in the Amazon means. What would an ideal mean? What's the objective? It's certainly not rapid exploitation of resources. It's certainly not maximizing profits. It's certainly not doing nothing. It's certainly not leaving people impoverished. There should be goals that are stated that understand the ramifications. Then there's a lot of analytical work that I believe should be spelled out, and I just want to mention a few, uh, a few of the issues. First, is the question of resource exploitation. What is safe to do? What kinds of projects are safe, especially among bigger projects? Should there be mining projects, oil projects, dams, uh, major projects? What does that mean for biodiversity? What does it mean for ecosystem functions? What does it mean for disruption of communities? These are traditional questions but there is a list of at least 10 mega projects on the agenda right now of infrastructure, mining, hydrocarbons, hydropower, and so on. Most of these are highly political. Most of them have not been analyzed by science in a sound way and in a way that's been communicated for the public. They should be, and I would hope that the governments would allow that to happen because I think that that's really important. And these are very tricky questions. I wish I knew the answer to them. I'm supposed to be an expert in some of this, but I don't know the answer to any of those questions. Is there such thing as safe roads through a, for a rainforest? 
is there such thing as a safe dam on the Amazon? What could be done? Is there such thing as a good mining project in Yasuni? I don't know. Okay, so that's one kind of question. A second question, it seems to me, that's quite major is the broad question of the teleconnections of the Amazon to the rest of regional and global ecosystems in two directions. What does global change mean for the Amazon? For instance, the theory that the warming will lead to drying of the Amazon. How robust is that theory? Because if it's true, it's hugely important for all of the geopolitics of this region, especially to get the region to stand up and demand even faster action by the rest of the world to stop climate change. Because it could be that even if this region protects the Amazon, it's going to be destroyed by drying coming from global forcings rather than from local deforestation. Second is what are the consequences regionally and globally of alterations of the Amazon? If there is more deforestation, what are the effects beyond the Amazon in terms of rainfall, precipitation, of course, loss of biodiversity, and other ecosystem functions? That's a second category that seems to me to be very important. Of course, a third fundamental question that is purely, in my view, or overwhelmingly a scientific question is how does one measure the state of the Amazon and change? What is the monitoring systems? What are the metrics? What's in place? What should be in place to record year-to-year -year changes of land use patterns, deforestation, biodiversity, pollution, weather changes that might be related to long-term climate changes, socioeconomic change, population flows, that kind of monitoring system is crucial for achieving any kinds of goals. So once you have goals, you need monitoring. What is that monitoring system right now? Do we know who lives in the Amazon? How many people? How they move? What their socioeconomic conditions are? Do we have a good map of, uh, I suppose we do have a good map of annual weather patterns and their trends to be able to map climate change. What about land use now? Can satellite data give all of the ground-based knowledge that one needs to capture carefully the changes also of carbon flux and so on, which is very important for the global carbon budget? What do we know? What is measured about biodiversity change? So I would urge a monitoring and measurement system and a reporting system coming from the scientific community. I don't know what exists, so I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel here. I'm trying to suggest what I think would be necessary to achieve sustainable development in the region. There are many other issues that are pertinent how would one create local incentives to avoid deforestation? This is the red plus issue. How to implement the kind of program that Norway and Brazil have started to pioneer, but is clearly just a small part of what needs to be a much bigger program. How should we consider the Yasuni offer of the Ecuador government? My instinct is to support it as a really creative approach to say we won't do this, but you pay us for that. But to make that case, we should have the scientific community saying back to the powers that mock this, that's real, that's not a joke, that's a very serious proposal. But in order to build up such an answer requires an analytical foundation that did not exist at the time the Yusuni proposal was made. There was one consulting firm that was hired to do an analysis in my view, it was not a sound analysis because it took certain issues off the table. The consulting firm was told right at the beginning the world won't pay for the avoided carbon dioxide, it won't pay for the ecosystem services, it won't pay for this, it won't pay for that. It was given a very small mandate. And 
the rest of the world said, we're not interested in paying Ecuador money not to develop these resources, but it didn't think very hard about it. And my view is we should try to resurrect proposals like that on a more serious basis for the Amazon to say certain things shouldn't happen, but maybe there should be compensation to governments when they protect these regions at a global scale to, to pay for these protected services. There clearly is a lot of innovation about how to deliver more effective human services to the populations of the region, which are very poor in the more remote areas. And that is where information technology, health extension, education extension can all play a significant role. Thinking also about what kind of jobs are sustainable jobs for people in the Amazon, for the tens of millions of people who live here. Certain answers are obvious, but other answers are not so obvious about uh, that question. And I would ask, of course, it's one of the most asked questions here, but in the whole SDG agenda, the question of cultural protection is so badly handled because no one knows how to handle it. No one knows in sustainable development what cultural sustainability really means operationally. But here you have not only diverse uh, bio, biological diversity, you have human diversity, which is extraordinary, one could say primordial, and needs an answer, and offers a model for the rest of the world also. One thing I've learned, by the way, in my experience as an economic advisor in all parts of the world is, show me an indigenous population and I will show you a maltreated population. It's unbelievable how in every part of the world the native populations are hated, shunned, pushed into tiny, difficult uh, ecosystems if they stay alive. And so this is a human trait which goes back a very long time and we're finding out it goes back even farther than we thought, maybe to Neanderthals and, uh, and uh, the, the true original sins of our species. But this question about what is the cultural answer is an Amazon question that could also inform a world discussion in a very serious way. And so I would like that very much on the table. Finally, let's think about September. September will be uh, two things. One is the leadership meeting of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. And so we should definitely have a report about the Amazon at that meeting. That'll be a worldwide meeting. And then a couple of days after that meeting will be the three-day head of state summit on sustainable development. That'll be the largest ever gathering of heads of state on the issue of sustainable development. There'll be probably about 170 world leaders at the UN next fall. And we're hoping the Pope will be there as well. Uh, and it will be, a, I think, a very big deal. As part of that, there will be side sessions, many side sessions. And I think one side session we should have certainly is IAP and SDSN on exactly the topic of today, science and sustainable development. And we could have Ianis and SDSN present the Amazon case at that session. And so we should think about inside the three-day high-level event to put the Amazon agenda forward. But with really ideas, here's the vision, here's how the goals can be set, here's what a monitoring system would mean, a lot of progress between now and September in terms of presenting the framework. We should hurry, because uh, we need to hurry. Thanks a lot. Thank you.